I'm ready. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Olua Shell. I did Joshua B. Um, for those who don't know me, um, I work with Stand to End Rape Initiatives there. It's an NGO that provides support services to survivors of domestic and sexual violence in Nigeria. And I've been doing this for the past six years. But I'm on this call for a totally different reason. And that's because I had an experience that changed my life and you know made me appreciate life more because I am alive right now. Um, you must have seen the news, you must have seen everywhere that I um, went to the UK for a top level event and I met very important people, you know, an opportunity that every person would be grateful to have. I had a very good time in the UK and I met people, you know, I met great people um, and, but I, I was very, I was scared, you know, about COVID-19 in the UK. Um, but I didn't, you know, I was careful, you know, I would wash my hands, sanitize, I avoided taking the tube a lot of times, I would walk like 20 minutes, 30 minutes distance, I would rather walk it. Um, hi everyone, saying hello. Um, so yeah, let's get to it. I got back to Nigeria, but it wasn't that at that point I knew something was wrong. It was on my flight, coming back home, like... I was feeling feverish on the flight. I, I felt hot, I felt cold, I was sweating, which was weird. But in my mind, I thought, oh, maybe it's because I'm really stressed for my travel and that's why I'm experiencing, you know, the fever. I got to the airport, I was like, oh, thank God, there are health officials here. They will find out if something is wrong with me. So they, they checked me, hi guys. <laughs> they checked, you know, my temperature was very high. So they asked me to step aside, which I did. But like about 10 minutes or 15 minutes after, they were like, let's check you again. And they did, and I was fine. So I thought, oh, maybe I was just overthinking it. I, you know, I don't have COVID, I'm fine. I got home and it was worse. I was cold. <sighs> I was... I was really sad because you know, I'd gotten home, I wanted to hug my mom, hug my dad, but I couldn't because I knew something was wrong and I didn't want to put them at risk. So I told them, don't touch me. And my, my dad was like, why? You know, I'm happy you went to, you know, the UK to do such a very glorious thing. I'm really excited. I want to celebrate with you. And I said, no, don't celebrate with me. Don't touch me right now. I don't feel well. And, you know, I felt bad saying that to my parents. Like, you can't hug me. You can't touch me. But it was important for me to do that at the time because I didn't know if I had COVID or not. So it was important for me to, you know, make sure my parents are safe because I love them too much for them to experience that. So the few days after became terrible. I had to self-isolate. I had, like, so many interviews I had planned. I couldn't attend. I had to cancel. I had like contracts, like juicy contracts I was supposed to sign. I couldn't sign them. But I had to self-isolate because it was a responsible thing to do, regardless of what I was going to lose at the end of the day. So, you know, I told my mom, when you want to serve me food, make sure you wear your mask. Make sure you wear your hand gloves. When you drop the plate of food, go and wash your hands. <laughs> and sanitize when you want to come back to get the plates wash your hands again and sa like you I was military with my parents because I was I was so conscious for them not to get infected I was like you know I give you rules you must obey and I was in pain at the time but you know my parents understood that you know there's something going on with this young woman who just abide by everything she says so my mom was very careful when you know serving me food when coming to my room you know, um, just trying to be extremely cautious. And so when my symptoms got worse, like I will see food, I can't eat, you know. Um, and even the, the little I will eat, I will go to the toilet and throw everything, you know, out of my mouth or wherever it's coming out from. <laughs> so, like, I was like, there's something definitely wrong. Like, I was like, God, I hope it's not COVID because I cannot survive. Because, you know... Th when you see data online about those who have died in like advanced countries, you're like very scared, you know, about the system in Nigeria. Can I survive? You know, will I make it and all of that? So I, and I spoke to my friend and he said, oh, let's call NCDC. 
and say yes it don't happen trailer don't jam out so i called ncdc and then i told them about my symptoms and you know they said um go to luth to get tested so i was like okay great i went to my room you know um started getting dressed you know and i was like mom hand gloves dad mask i'm not joking with you guys so we're about to leave when you know um they called back and said you know don't go the team will come and test you at home and at that point i knew something was wrong i was worried if you know i can't step out of my house and they have to come to me based on the symptoms i had mentioned that means something must have been wrong so i kept waiting for them to come and test me you know nobody came and my friend went online and was trying to you know get the attention one way or the other you know calling them out like test my friend she's sick test my friend so eventually they came they tested me like they came in their full regalia like military like all of that protective personal protective equipment even me i was like wow i'm in deep shit like everyone in my parents house were like looking like does this girl have COVID? What's going on? So anyways, they came in, you know, took like um, sputum, that is saliva, took some things from my nose, took something else from my mouth, and then they said, they'll get back to me about my result. I was very anxious, but I just wanted to be sure because I was in so much pain. I just wanted to be sure that it wasn't COVID. At least, you know, let me be sure for the sake of my family and myself. And so the next day, you know, at 12 midnight, I just heard, Mama, wake up. And that's when my dad calls me Mama. So I jump, like, you know when somebody's calling your spirit out of your body in Nigerian movies? So I woke up and I was like, what's wrong, what's wrong? And he said, they've come for you. And I was like, who? Who is they? Because <laughs> it was 12 a.m. Like, who is coming for me? And he said, oh, the healthcare workers, you know. I'm going to take some questions. How long did you have to wait before you got your result? Okay, keep you know sending in the questions. I will respond um, as soon as I can. So, you know, um, I asked them, why are you here for me? And then they said, we're here to pick you. To where? And then they said, isolation center. And I was like, oh my God, do I have COVID? And they're like, oh, they can't tell me. And I said, tell me, if I'm going to go to the center with you, I need to know. I called NCDC at that time, like around to one in the morning. And I said, can I know my results? And then they said, he tested positive. I cried. I really cried. Like, oh my God. Like, how do I go from representing the Commonwealth at a global event to coming back home and I have COVID? And with the data you see online and in the news about those who die, you know, I was really worried. I was like, you know, is Nigeria ready to handle my situation? I had so many questions. So in the ambulance, um, I called like my partner at the time and I was crying and crying on the phone. I was really worried, I won't even lie. Um, I didn't have strength at that time to think, oh, I, you can do it, girl, you can make it through. I was really, really scared. So I got to the center and then I asked you guys to bring wine. I brought tea, so I'll be sipping my tea. So I got to isolation center and, and there was nobody there, but you know, the guys in the ambulance were like furious. Where are these people? You know, they should come and attend to this girl. And so about a, almost one hour actually, or thereabout, then they eventually came out and you know, when they were talking to me, it felt so distant and so cold. I didn't really, you know, get like support and the love I was expecting. Like, are you okay? Do you need water? Do you need this? It was just about where did you come back from? Which date? What's the flight number? What's your name? And I was like, I already gave this information to NCDC and Lagos State Ministry. I just want to sleep. It's, you know, past 1 a.m. So I had to wait for like two hours in that ambulance. And then they took me to my space. I'm sure some of you have seen the pictures. Um, it was very quiet there. You know, there was nobody. It was just me. And I was like, God, like only me here. How will I survive? You know? But, you know, I, I just had to, you know, encourage myself. It was really tough because my symptoms were getting worse. I was throwing up. I was having diarrhea. I was dizzy. You know, I would look at my fingers and count. And it's not really what I'm, I'm counting that is the correct answer. Like, I was losing my vision. 
you know, and I was like, God, will I make it through? Will I make it through? So they gave me a doctor's number I can always chat with. And, you know, I would text him and say, doctor, please, I don't want to die. I'll call my friends and say, please pray for me. I don't want to die. You know, at some point I was even like, wait, I will go to London, make a global name for myself and straight to death. Like, is that how life is? I was not thinking about all the things I've not done in my life, the things I've not enjoyed, you know, all the monies I've saved with the hope for a future. Like, who's going to spend all this money on my behalf? Like, what's going to happen to my family, you know, my organization that I've been working so hard for the past six years to build? I was very worried. I had so much, you know, concern. But you know, my family, my friends, you know, were encouraging me, supporting me. But it was very tough. You know how bad it is that you will see water and you cannot drink water? Like, it was that bad. I couldn't drink water. And I was vomiting water. So picture this. A pipe of water, when it breaks into two, you know how water will gush out of that pipe? That's how water was gushing out of my system. And I was throwing up every food in my system. And I had medications to take. Sometimes in the morning, the tablet is like 8, in the afternoon, it's like 13, in the evening, it's like 10 or 12. Every day, medication, and I was throwing up, and still throwing up. But the nurses would come and, you know, encourage me. We, we sort of built like a good relationship afterwards, where they would come and encourage me and say nice words. And, you know, sometimes when they come and take my vitals, when I see their faces, I know something is wrong. So they would tell me, we need you to fight. Your vitals are low. Your blood pressure is saying abnormal. And that's not good for you. Your pulse is low. And my pulse is basically how my um, how oxygen is passing through my lungs. So if my pulse is, you know, reducing, it means that I'm going to start having shortness of breath, which means straight to ICU, which is not a good thing for me. So there's this painting on the wall. Um, it says, I can't remember word for word, but it says, I think, um, um, ah, what's that word? Is this struggle now or something now so they can live the rest of your life as a champion? So when I'm throwing up, I will look up at that wall. I will look at the writing and the painting and I will try to drink water. I will vomit. I would look at that wall again and still drink the water again. In fact, at some point, I started, you know, cheating my system. So I realized that when I'm awake, my system knows that I'm awake, so it doesn't let me eat anything. So what I do is I would force myself to sleep for one hour, wake up. Within the space of five to ten minutes, I'll quickly drink water because my system still assumes I'm sleeping. So I'll quickly drink water and then you know, go back to sleep again, wake up, drink water. That's how I was able to, you know, fight gradually, taking water in my system, eating a bit. I would vomit still, but I was still like, you know what, I die here. Like, I would die to survive. Like, I would do all I can. And, you know, my family was just there to support me, for me to cope with the people in the world with me because other people started joining in. And I was like, oh, my God, this thing is really spreading and it's not a good thing for us. But, you know, we became a family accountability partner where we check on each other. Have you taken your drugs? Have you eaten? Yeah, check, take, take water. By medical standard, I'm supposed to take four liters of water every, every day. So, which means I have to take four bottles of water every day four bottles of water and I was struggling to even take half a bottle so I would force myself I really really struggled um, to survive and so you know when I want to vomit I will hold it because the doctor said they need me to fight not to vomit so I can feel the vomit in my throat like it's moving up and down I can feel it wants to come out but you know when you have vomit in your mouth and you're holding it that we will die dear I would not vomit I was holding it you know just for it to retain in my stomach so my my you know medication doesn't go out because I need those drugs and then as I was taking the drugs I was also dealing with the side effects of the drugs because the drugs also causes nausea and diarrhea and vomiting so I had vomiting on my own and then vomiting out of out of um, taking that medication so it was very tough, but I, I, you know, I kept fighting, kept taking my drugs. I didn't miss my drug for one day, even though it was hard to swallow. I continued taking my drugs, and 
you know, gradually the nurses will come and check my vitals and say, yay, go Shail, go, like, it was like a family, you, you know, like, go Shail, we're proud of you, your vitals are getting better. And you know, those kind of words of encouragement were helping me, so I would take my drug, they would say, yeah, try to eat one spoon, I would take one spoon, I would want to vomit, I will hold it, take another spoon, like, maybe 20 minutes after. That's how I was eating, gradually, gradually. I got my sense of taste back, like, Hey, but I, I don't used to eat. Never tasted a, any better in my entire life. Like, Eba was good the first time I got my taste bud back and I ate it. You know, and that's how, I, you know, I gradually recovered, taking my drugs. Then I, I now became, like, accountability partner to others. So those were not having the side effects of what I experienced. I was not like, oh, look at me. I was like, you two days ago, you can do it. Take water. Take the drug. Look at the wall. You can do it. Like, it became like a church. We even had... I led church service in the world. I led prayer session. It was a very medical battle, but also spiritual battle. Like, I was like, we will not die here. None of us will die, you know. Um, and that's, you know, that's how I recovered. And when they said, you know, they, need to, they were testing us every two days, and they said they needed to test us again because I tested negative ones. Oh, my God. I went on my knees. I was praising God. I said, like, God, I tested negative. They're like, they, in fact, they're so excited for me. Like, I recovered really quick. And they had to check, you know, to make sure that I get negative results again. So I was praying to God, this second one must not be positive. You know, it has to be negative. It has to be negative. I've been taking my drugs, God. I've been doing everything. There was even a time that I took bread and water. I did only communion. I said, God, this water represents your blood. This bread represents your flesh. As I'm eating it, I am getting my full recovery. Like, it was a spiritual war that I was going through. But it was a war worth it because I trusted so much in God. And, you know, I got discharged. They had to, like, um, what's that thing? Disinfect all of my things. And, you know, they told me to still stay safe. Though I have enough antibodies right now to protect me. But they, someone said, flip your phone. Oh, is something wrong with the way the phone is? Sorry. Um, so anyway, um, I got discharged and I came home. And, you know, it's been great trying to get my life back and, you know, connecting with people and granting interviews. And it's important that, you know, I'm also helping government to create awareness about the virus because some people think, oh, it's a lie, it's propaganda, but it's not. I mean, I went through it. COVID-19 kicked me. It kicked my system. Like I, there were days I said, you know what? Let me start planning. You know, for for a a succession plan for Stanton Entrepreneur Initiative because I didn't think I was going to make it through. But guess what? I killed COVID, and here I am. You know, doing good. So to everyone out there who is you know fighting COVID, I'm sending you so much strength and so much love. To anyone who lost any relative or a loved one, I'm really sorry for your loss. And may God, you know, strengthen your family. Um, and I'm, oh, someone says, flip your phone. Is something wrong with the way my phone is? So someone just asked me. So now I'll take your questions because um, I have just 10 more minutes. Uh, someone asked me how long was I at the exhibition center for? I was there for two weeks. Um, I was receiving treatment for two weeks. Someone says, you were planning succession? Yes, I was because I didn't think I was going to make it. So it was important for me to... Um, you know, start planning how the organization will grow without me. Um, someone says, are you still on any medication? No. So once you test negative twice, it means you will get, um, you will build antibodies, which will help you fight against reinfection. So you don't have to take your medication anymore. So I'm chilling. But I'm taking tea, vitamin C tea, to keep me going. Any more questions? Thank you for the congratulation me uh, messages. Thank you so much. Amen to your prayers. Someone said, no, please let your phone be straight. Hmm. Wow. Um, what other advice were you given after the recovery? I was just told, you know, to stay safe um, and be well, um, basically. That's all I was told. Um, what advice do you have for those who are refusing to stay at home, guys? Because the danger you're causing is, some people are symptomatic, which means they don't have symptoms. They don't 
show this they don't exhibit the symptoms but they have the virus in their body and they are they can infect someone as much as myself who had symptoms could could have done so you need to please stay at home for your own purpose and also for the purpose of every Lagosian or every Nigerian out there because the more you go out, the more you're susceptible to coming in contact with someone who has COVID. And if you're like a blood type A like myself, it's really tough. I promise you, it's really tough. So please stay at home. Did you experience sore throat and dry cough? Yes, I had dry cough, but I didn't have sore throat. Um, I didn't have, but I had like very prolonged and painful dry cough. I did have that. Um, tips for safety. Stay in your house. That's how we tell you. Watch TV. Um, do your work from home. Just stay at home. That's all I can advise you. Stay at home. How was the isolation center? It was good. It was very, you know, very spacious, very, very nice. It was actually very good. It was very good. What was your relationship with the medical team? We built a relationship. We became like a family because like these are the guys that your life is basically in, your, in their hands. So you just have to build like a relationship with them. So I did. I built a relationship with them and you know, they were like a family to me. Was the isolation center comfortable? Yes, it was comfortable. Um, it was very good. Can vitamin C provide immunity? I'm not sure, but vitamin C does help to build, you know, your immune system. But if you have COVID already, it won't really matter really so if you don't have it it's, it's best that you build your immune system right now how long was the progression of your symptoms hmm i think for about six days like it was subtle it became better than it became worse it was like like this and worse so yeah uh where did you get vitamin c <laughs> my friend leila johnson salami gave me the tea at the isolation center and i brought it home because they cannot waste why am I your own? <laughs> can someone who tests a negative still test positive? I don't think you can. I mean, once you test negative, um, yes, you actually can if you don't stay in your house. If you come in contact with someone who tests positive and you've tested negative, of course you get um, infected. But if you've been positive and then received treatment and then got negative, um, you can't contract again because your antibodies will fight for you. Um, okay, so any more questions um, for me before I go in six minutes? What medications were you on? No, <laughs> no I won't tell you so that nobody goes to abuse any medication. No, but I was given medication that was good for me. Yeah, you all want to know the medication. Not telling. Mm-mm. Lip sealed, but they were good medication for my body. Uh -uh, what type of medication? Good to hear that more people will test positive. Yeah, 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 I'm so excited. Like, I was keeping in touch with people in the center. Um, when they got discharged, they you know, shared their stories with me. I was very happy. How effective is lemon water? Sis, I don't have an idea, honestly, but ask the healthy um, um, health advisors about that. I, I really don't know. But I think lemon, lemon is good anyway. Um... How many pills did they give you? It, 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 it depends on how I was feeling that day. So there were days I was, I was taking 8, 13, 10. There were days that I had 10, 10, 10, like even 10, 15, 10 or 15, 12. It depends on how my symptoms um, was. And then even at, at some point, they had to give me injection because there was a particular drug that my body was overpowering. So they had to give me like injection to help me. Were you on a ventilator? No, I wasn't because I thought, you know, um, I tried, you know, to help my body fight as well. So I, I wasn't on a ventilator, but it was a scary time for me. Did I consider escaping the center? No, I wanted to get better and get well. Why would I want to escape the center? You never ever caught to me, but some people try to, in another word, and they caught them, but I didn't try that. Um, do you think we have more cases than NCDC? I really can't speak for NCDC, um, but I would want to trust their data because they are the most credible source of information right now. So I'm hoping that the data is correct. So I won't speak further on that. Um, it's not okay to include about the medication. Yeah, yeah I, I can't talk about it because so people don't, you know, abuse it. It's very important that we are responsible. Did you do the breathing test of holding your breath for over 10 minutes to know if you're infected? Um, it wasn't 10 minutes. It was more like 10 seconds or one 
one minute and it was basically for me to cough out anything in my throat which was going to be tested to check for covid so that was all i did um during the test what do you think we're doing differently compared to other countries we seem to be doing great so far i mean kudos to the Lagos state government and to the nigerian government um we we seem to to be handling the situation good um i don't know what we are doing differently because i haven't understood what other countries are doing but i would say we're doing a great job and we can only improve on it going forward with the rates of discharge does it mean any cdc have the cure so there's no cure there's no vaccine right now for you know covid but there are medications to help manage and reduce the viral load and you know kind of suppress how it fights your immune system and your body and your lungs so that's what you know the medical team is currently doing um and i, I guess it's it's really working because i mean i'm well i'm good um when do you think people are People are hiding travel history because people are stigmatizing. I'm not excusing it and it is wrong. Please declare your travel history so the, gov the healthcare workers can know how to help you. But again, I want to ad address stigmatization. Please, for no reason should you stigmatize those who test positive. It's not a death sentence. It's not something you wish on yourself. It's something people experience by no fault of theirs. But the more you stigmatize, the more you make people want to suppress information or keep information so that they are not stigmatized. And that's how we would you know, keep um, spreading this virus. Because people are not saying the truth about where they've been and they're saying oh i have malaria whereas they've been in the uk or in the us or in italy then the doctors will only treat malaria and then the doctors are at risk of contracting it as well and like you know we don't have enough doctors in nigeria so let's respect ourselves and stop stigmatizing how was your mental state it was bad um, my mental state was bad while at the center because i was like this is it i'm going to die you know you know where i imagine how heaven looks like like i was already seeing my place my seat in heaven and my mansion but then I had to get myself together and I said, you know what, my, my, you know, God is not done with me. My purpose on earth has not been fully accomplished, you know, so I had to like fight my mental space and, you know, um, help build my own mental, uh, mental wellness to fight the, the um, virus. So I was good. I was good. Um, I did. I did well. Uh, I don't know what antibodies look like. I don't know if it's drug. It's not drug or water. It's in your body. <laughs> It's not something you take in. It's inside your body. Um, so my final question, um, do you think bringing in the Chinese doctor is a good idea? I mean, because they have experienced it, maybe they have like some insights they could bring on board. And that's why, you know, like I read, it's just advisory role, not, not directly handling cases. So I would say maybe it's a good idea that, you know, we have to cross, cross learn at this point. Nobody is an expert. We're all learning through the virus. So whatever we can cross share, that's great. So, um, any post care? That's my final question. Yes, I have a mental team, a mental team following up with me to ensure that I'm doing very well, and you know to make sure I'm doing great. So, um, thank you so much for joining this call. Um, I've come to the end of the conversation. If you have more questions, please follow me at Ayodeji Oshowobi, A Y O D E J I O S O W O B I. And to know more about the work that I do, please follow at Stand to End Rape. If you have any more questions, please go to my page. I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much for your time. Stay safe. You know, practice social distancing. Stay well. Namaste. Bye. After the rain, joy comes in the morning.